Hello, and welcome to Refs Dugog. I've decided to foray into the realm of post PS3 PS2 games in order to play Eternal Poison, also known in Japan as Poison Pink. After staring down ESPN Winter X Games snowboarding like the barrel of a loaded gun for months, I figured a break from launch titles was necessary, and this game looked interesting enough, and it also had Atlas's name on it, so I figured, what the hell. Eternal Poison is a tactical RPG with a light sprinkling of visual novel elements. It'll have you fire embleming your way through five separate storylines, each of which has unique characters and parties to work through the game as. To give you a brief, non-spoilery rundown of what's going on in this game, Valdia, an empire with heavy theocratic influence, has had its princess go missing. This happens in tandem with the appearance of an extraplanar realm known as Bessic. This leads Valdis, the current king of Valdia, to send out a countrywide call to arms, where whoever brings back Princess Lenarche will be rewarded with their greatest desires. This is the backdrop to the five storylines, but not all who enter Bessic do so with the intent of rescuing Lenarche. Bessic could never be so simple. It is said within the heart of Bessic lies something called the Eternal Poison. The Valdian Church believes the Eternal Poison can grant any wish. The Church of Stag, a multi-theistic church exiled from the Valdian Empire, believes the Eternal Poison bestows great power. The truth, however, is completely unknown. Nobody knows what form the Eternal Poison takes, or if it truly even exists. Eternal Poison starts you out with a cutscene and a tutorial. This will be the first of many battles you'll need to overcome, and will give you a taste of the main systems in the game. Your party will be deployed on this isometric grid, and you'll have to defeat all enemies or complete some other objective. Rather than taking turns controlling your pieces, Eternal Poison opted for a speed-based system, where the fastest characters will get to go first, as denoted by the turn order bar at the bottom right. Each character and monster will be able to wield certain types of spells and attacks, and each character and monster will, in turn, have certain weaknesses and defenses versus each type of attack. These can be seen by hovering over and inspecting any given monster. Each monster will also have an overkill HP stat, as well as their actual HP bar. Oh yeah, the monsters are called Majin, which translates loosely into Devil. Regardless, if you kill a Majin with an attack that exceeds their health threshold, all of the extra damage goes towards that overkill HP. If you cross the overkill health, the Majin gets sealed with this cool ass cross effect. Now that the Majin is sealed, you can spend one of your party member's turns capturing the Majin. I'll talk about what you could do with these bad boys later, so I'll save the Shin Megami Tensei memes for then. Now, you may wonder how you're able to do enough damage to hit these overkill thresholds, especially later in the game when the Majin health and resistances will be way higher. This is where the combo attack comes in. If you forego attacking on one of your party member's turns, you can actually have them take their action on the main character's turn instead. The main character being the one titular to the specific storyline you're playing. So Tage, Olifin, Ashley, or one of the other unlockable main characters. The combo attack allows you to use more than one party member who had foregone their attack to combine their attacks together, generally doing a large amount of damage. Not only does it help you hit that overkill, but the EXP system in Eternal Poison works in such a way that more damage equals more XP. For example, say Olifin here does 80 damage with his sword, which is relatively respectable. 
However, our boy Lavat here is lagging behind in XP because he's either been dying and not getting any XP for battles or just really hasn't been doing a lot of healing or support spells. Lavat's melee damage isn't that high because he's a healer, so if we were to use his turn to attack, he would only do 20 damage, which is pretty poor for XP gaining. However, if we combine Olifan and Lavat's attacks, they deal 100 damage together, and they both individually gain the XP for that 100 damage. Because the progression in Eternal Poison is linear, not linear in the sense that there is one path, but linear in the sense that you can't go back to farm, you need to be ferrying your lower leveled allies by having them do combos with the stronger ones. I like these mechanics because they mesh together in an interesting way. As I mentioned earlier, each character in Majin has a set of strengths and weaknesses versus certain types of attacks and elements. This means you'll want to be varying your limited party size so that you can cover as many weaknesses as possible. You want characters that can deal each of the three types of melee damage, and magic characters that cover at least some of the more common magical elements. This is cool, however it seems like no matter what path you take, eventually some of the elements get shafted. Water is rarely useful and wind is almost never useful, so characters that use these are generally not worth taking with you unless they provide some other benefit to the party. There is also the matter of equipping each of your party members to take full advantage of these attacks, however I'll touch up on that later. The mechanic I don't like is the demon aura. The basic idea is once you come to a boss, you'll need a specific type of attack to break the demon aura on the boss, otherwise you can't damage him at all. To explain my disdain for the demon aura, I need to go further into the gameplay structure of Eternal Poison. Vesic is a four-tiered path upward, with branching pathways at each tier. After the first encounter on the first tier of Vesic, you'll be able to go to a main hub town by the name of Isopolis. You'll be able to buy weapons, prepare yourself, and gain mercenaries amongst other things. So basically the loop will look like this. Prepare at Isopolis, view story, do battle, view story, return to Isopolis. You have the opportunity to save your game at both Isopolis and before each battle. If you're not rotating your saves, you can soft lock your playthrough because you're told the requirements for breaking the demon aura through character banter during the battle. If you don't have the right spell or the right character leveled up to have an aptly powerful spell of a specific attribute, you can't go back to town and get it. You'll die to the boss and it'll put you back at the pre-battle preparation screen. At its best, it's a small annoyance and makes the encounter arbitrarily longer, and at its worst, it's possibly save breaking. My frustrations with demon auras aside, now is as good a time as ever to talk about Isopolis. Isopolis is a city you're invited to take refuge in by a nobleman by the name of Count Dufaustin. You'll use this place as a sort of home base between each step in your long trudge through Bessic. There's a good amount of stuff to do here. Twilight's Rest has a few options, such as saving and loading. You can check equipment and items here, and you can also take a peek at the lexicon to view all the Majin you've encountered or captured. Most importantly though is the visit option. As you travel through Bessic, you'll come across refugees that you'll save. This is where they go. You'll be able to talk to them between each excursion into Bessic, and they have nice little stories and subplots for you to engage with. Aside from revealing interesting things about the universe of Eternal Poison and the nature of Bessic, they'll also reward you with a nice item if you talk to them long enough and complete their stories. Over at the Usaporium, you can buy and sell weapons and attach skills that you've acquired to your weapons. At the Libertine, you can hear some gossip about the mercenaries you've hired that hang around town. Afterwards, you'll be given the option to play that one game that they have at Cracker Barrel with the pins. You can unlock some nice art to look at later by beating these little games. Also, near the Libertine is a stage where you'll unlock new songs as you progress throughout the game. Hanging around Isopolis are many wanderers. You'll have the opportunity to talk to all of them and they'll give you neat little tidbits about themselves. Some of them are mercenaries that you'll be able to recruit to fight with you, so it's good to talk to pretty much everybody as you progress through the game. Those Majin we talked about capturing, you can use them at the Traviata house. You have a few options on what you can do with these guys. You get spells out of them by throwing them into Archaea here's giant ninja blender. Now that's one touch intelligence. Watch this. You see the Nutri Ninja has an 1100 watt power base that drives our pro extractor blades which helps emulsify and pulverize all the fruits and vegetables, even ice for cool, refreshing, deliciously drinkable super juices. Let's try the results. You can also sell them, which gets you some currency and also has the chance to unlock items to be sold to you based on what Majin you're selling. To my chagrin, the Extract PP option did not unlock the erotic section of the game with Archaea. It just gives you more poison points, which you use as a resource to control the Majin. That's right, here come the SMT memes.
Anyway, it would be cool if summoning the Majin was actually worth it, but they have very limited usability, and I'll tell you why. You have seven character slots. A certain amount will be filled with compulsory story characters. Tage and Ashley's story have three of such characters, and Ollie Finn's has four. This means when choosing your party, pretty much half of your party is already locked in. Using Tage as an example, you'll only have four extra party members. This is fine because the mercenaries are designed to round out the different starting teams, however the Majin also count towards that limit. So if you wanted to start a mission with a Majin on your team, you'd be giving up a valuable mercenary slot. In spite of sounding like a broken record, I'll say it again, Eternal Poison's progression is completely linear. You can't go back to farm for experience. Majin don't gain experience. If you catch a Majin at level 7, it will always be level 7. If a Majin gains 40 experience, at the end of this battle, that 40 experience will be divvied amongst the 6 remaining party members. 7 experience per character is pitiful, and you're missing out on the opportunity to level a 7th party member who would have gained much more experience throughout the battle by themselves. Also, the mercenaries are just better than the Majin. The Majin have a very limited moveset based on what kind of Majin they are, and they have a very small amount of spell uses. Capturing them is still good though because you can sell them and gain new items for your party members, but using them is such a wash. You can summon them in battle if one of your party members dies, but with the experience and items you're gaining from not using the Majin, you really shouldn't have to worry about that. Is 2008 still the age of game manuals? I don't know, but Eternal Poison has me thinking that it may be the case. The most difficult part about playing through and reviewing this game is how little information the game actually gives you. Eternal Poison is a game that would benefit greatly from the inclusion of tool tips. To illustrate this, I'm going to ask you a question. What do these symbols mean? You can probably guess what some of them are and what they do, and some you'll find their names through spells and abilities you gain, but you'll never know what they do unless you use the game manual or a game facts. Round 2. What do you think these symbols are? I couldn't tell you. I played the whole game without knowing. They're evade chance, counter chance, and critical chance. The UI is filled with clutter and issues, like why are these two equipment screens different? Why can I put skills on my armor here in the shop, but I have to go over to Twilight's Rest to put consumables in my inventory? I acquire skills at the Traviata house, and I acquire consumables at the shop. I feel like the game wants to waste as much of your time as possible. You'll also want to keep your party's inventory updated as they gain levels. You have seven characters to take care of. Each can wield up to three different types of weapons, a piece of armor, and two accessories. Most characters have two to three weapon types that you want to have equipped on them so that you can cover weapon type weaknesses on enemies. Managing that much equipment for that many party members gets to be very monotonous. I feel like the equipment system could do with a little more simplification. Characters already have niches that they fill, so it couldn't hurt to lean into that further. Everything in Eternal Poison that's not gameplay or story is an absolute slog of guesswork and tedium. It may seem like I'm nitpicking, but my grievances with this game are more like death by a thousand paper cuts rather than a single blow. See, there's a lot of good stuff to say about Eternal Poison. I don't hate it, it just frustrates me. This is the part where a better YouTube man would do a cool segue into talking about the better parts of the game. However, I am not a better YouTube man, so I'm going to do the less apt, yet still charming, overtly mentioning the transition technique. Atlas did a pretty good job at localizing this game. Getting Bang Zoom to do VA contracting seemed to have yielded good results, and there's only a few grammatical errors in the dialogue, which is pretty impressive for such a dialogue-heavy game. They also really nailed the aesthetic that the game is going for on the front and back covers. Very stylish, very cool. The soundtrack is also pretty good. It's just varied enough that I never get bored of it. If you're buying the complete copy of the game, it actually comes with the OST, which is named Tage Against the Majin. You like art? I like art. I also really like the art direction in Eternal Poison. Character design, background design, and level design all have moments where they look real fucking good. It's got a very nice painterly style. I found myself thinking about Symphony of the Night a decent amount while I was playing this. You may have noticed at this point, however, that the art is a bit scattershot sometimes. The back cover of this game describes the aesthetic of Eternal Poison as a gothic fairy tale, and I gotta say, none of these characters look like they listen to typo negative. Well, except maybe Ron Demian. On the real though, the way Eternal Poison is framed is definitely gothic, however aesthetically I feel like some of these characters belong to completely different series. Is. It turns out Flight Plan developed a good amount of games for Ben Presto, namely the Summon Knight series. Eternal Poison is one of these games. It seems like for this one, Ben Presto had a team aptly named Art Presto to take care of the art design. 
It seems like most of the important characters were designed by an artist by the name of Tomatika, and while I can't stress this enough, while I love the art for this game, some of the comments that Tomatika made in the Eternal Poison art book kind of tell me they didn't have a solid grasp on making sure the characters have a cohesive feel to them within the aesthetic of the game. Some other comments kind of tell me that this may be in part due to the pickiness on the client side, however, that's something I'll never know. Tomatika, however, is a great character artist and you should check him out on Twitter maybe. Also, this art book is amazing, and I totally recommend the plunder savvy of you to go to a certain European ocular website and use this directory to find it. That said, with really good art being a driving point for this game, I'm kinda wishy-washy on how I feel about the CG work. There are well-rendered CG movies very, very sparsely peppered throughout the game. While I'm reminded of a Final Fantasy game when I see them, I think they're very well done. The in-game 3D model work, however, I take a little bit of an issue with. Flight Plan outsourced CG production to a company by the name of Shiragumi Incorporated. I don't know if they handled the battle cutscenes, but I can't seem to find any credits that point elsewhere. Every time you attack a monster, or a monster attacks you, you'll watch a cutscene of it happening. If you're familiar with Fire Emblem, you'll know what I'm talking about. While the character models look fine themselves, the battle animation is pretty stiff, and there were very few that actually looked cool to me. Couple this with an absolutely horrendous load time between each battle cutscene, and you've got a recipe for me completely turning off the battle animations. No, seriously, if you skip each cutscene manually, it still has to load for 3 seconds on original hardware. I did some rough lowball estimates, but if you were to play the game with cutscenes on, each playthrough takes about 11 hours if you're plowing through the game. Each battle cutscene takes 3 seconds per load, so 13 missions times about 5 enemy attacks back and forth between each enemy, times 8 enemies per mission, times 2 times per battle cutscene that you had to load. That's 3120 seconds, or 52 minutes. This is without doing any bonus missions or taking into account bosses that you fight. 52 minutes of loading in an 11 hour storyline is borderline travesty. Now tell someone they have to do that 4.5 more times to get the true ending. Why yes, Reps to God viewer, I did say four and a half storylines, and I'm going to talk about all of them. While this section is going to be relatively spoiler heavy, I think knowing what I'm going to tell you is paramount to your decision on whether or not to play this game. If you want a spoiler free version of this review, you can skip ahead to the timecode on the screen. Each party will have to hit key gameplay objectives to get the true ending of their individual story. Most of the objectives are relatively simple and telegraphed, however certain characters <coughs> are much less overt in how they tell you what you need to do in the game. I'll get to that later, however. For now, I'll start with a brief description of story beats, beginning with Tage. Tage is plastered all over the art and promo material for the game, and it's very clear that she is the most important character. Tage is a dummy mommy with gothic lolita stylings. Who writes this stuff? While her motives are completely veiled in mystery, we know that she wields the Librum Vespera, which allows her to seal and capture Majin. Tage is accompanied by a Majin named Ranunculus, or Rocky for short. He is a very powerful Majin who takes the shape of a silver wolf. He's known in Bessic as the Guiding Sage, whose goal is to lead to the resurrection of the Majin God Izel. As Tage starts her journey into Bessic, she meets a white-haired boy with red eyes by the name of Redica. She takes an interest in him, and uses her Librum to dominate him, making Tage his master. Look, just to make sure that I don't bore you with too many details, each story thread unfolds in a similar fashion. The party doesn't trust each other for one reason or another, one party member is possessed in some capacity and gets unpossessed later. As they travel through Bessic, they argue and are generally hostile toward each other. Eventually, some information comes to light explaining how one of the party members isn't who they said they were, and after this, the party all gets along and continues their journey. Why can Tage dominate Redica? Well, he's human, right? No, he's a heretic. He's half Majin, half human. So Rocky absolutely hates Redica. We find out that this is because the Majin created heretics in order to try to rebirth Izel and are ashamed of their failures. Redica hates Rocky because Majin slaughtered his family. After this all comes out, Rocky and Redica reconcile their differences in order to be further domed by Tage. Tage's motives the entire time are a mystery until she eventually lets it out. Tage wants to destroy the world. Why? She won't tell us. Remember that King Valdis guy, the one who was trying to get people to save Princess Lenarche from Bessic? Yeah, it turns out he's the bad guy. He actually turned himself into a Majin and is trying to rebirth Izel by sacrificing Lenarche. You fight him, you kill him, Bessic crumbles, and then the story ends. 
Your progress is saved and you can start another playthrough on a different save slot. Cliffhanger 1. Since you've got the true ending here, you've unlocked the story of Ron Demian. He's the fourth route. Every character besides Tage will be given an artifact known as the Librum Aurora by Count Dufastin, the guy who owns Isopolis. The Librum Aurora is functionally similar to Tage's Librum Vespera in that it allows for the sealing and capture of Majin. The next storyline is Olifin, who is voiced by Johnny Young Bosch, by the way, pretty cool. He's a true blue Fire Emblem sword boy. He's the commander of the Valdian army and is set to marry Lenarche, who he is madly in love with. Logue is the second in command. He's meant to be the commander, however, he decided that Olifin would be a better leader. Lavat is a priest. He's one of the Pope's favorite disciple, and I don't want to think too hard about that one. And Mary is a magician priest. She's just kind of there to stir up drama. The party dynamic here is that Olifin is a giant bitch who is constantly mistrusting his ability to lead and having the whole imposter syndrome crisis. Logue is the super supportive mentor character, however in the past he was sent to fight a dragon and managed to slay it, but the dragon possessed him. This possession is worsening as Olifin's party travels through Bessic. We find out that Lavat is a spy for the Pope because there is a power struggle between the monarchy of Valdia and the theocratic wants of the Church of Valdia. Mary suspects Lavat of being a spy for the Pope, which he is. This comes to light, they all make up, they go kill the dragon that's possessing Logue, and Olifin learns to be a good leader man. Afterwards, you find Valdis. You fight him, you kill him, Bessic crumbles, then the story ends. Your progress is saved, and you can start another playthrough on a different save slot. Cliffhanger 2. Ashley is a priest. She's also the sister of the Princess Lenarche. She also has a Majin inside of her. Glynn is Ashley's childhood friend slash protector. Reyna is somebody who was sent by the Pope to protect Ashley. They all want to save Ashley's mentor, Master Leto, who looks sick by the way. Glynn doesn't trust Reyna. Reyna doesn't trust Glynn. Reyna, however, is not who she says she is. In fact, Reyna is some random dude who found Reyna's body with instructions from the Pope to assassinate Master Leto. This dude, who is very good at closing the pharyngeal tube, disguised himself as Reyna to try to get the eternal poison for himself. He finds out that Glynn is also an assassin for the Pope sent to kill Master Leto. However, it's revealed that Glynn is actually a double agent and was pretending to be an assassin to find out about the assassination plot to protect Master Leto, which never would have gone through because the real Reyna was just dead for reasons. Anyway, everyone's friends after this. Ashley kills her inner demon, you find Valdis, you fight him, you kill him, Bessic crumbles, and the story ends. Your progress is saved, and you can start another playthrough on a different save slot. Cliffhanger 3. Rondemian is a secret character that is unlocked by getting the true ending in one of the stories. He's a real gruff guy, he uses really big swords. He bears the name of an old hero who died slaying a legendary Majin by the name of Morpheus. Morpheus is strange because he doesn't have the biological imperative that other Majin have to rebirth Izel. Such things do not matter to him. So anyways, big shocker, our Rondemian is the same as the hero Rondemian. He's got this little girl following him around, her name is Ariel, she wants the eternal poison so that she can gain great power and avenge her village. A little bit into the story, your party is joined by Count Dufastin himself. He has a great interest in Rondemian. Long story short, Valdis sent Rondemian to fight Morpheus and betrayed him in one way or another. Rondemian survives and is really mad so he wants to kill Valdis. Morpheus, who has disguised himself as Dufastin as we find out, is also really mad and wants to kill Valdis. There are no conditions to actually unlock the ending for this path, so you find Valdis, you fight him, you kill him, Bessic crumbles, and then the story ends. Your progress is saved, and you can start another playthrough on a different save slot, Cliffhanger 4. Now, before I move forward, at this point you have played around 45 hours of this game, and that's being generous, it's likely more. While there are branching paths that you'll take to complete various objectives, there's a lot of overlap in the paths that each character takes. Because you're filling your party with mercenaries that are the same between runs, it will feel very samey the whole time. Every story has the same general beats. Drama that eventually leads to nothing, and eventually killing Valdis. Now let's say, hypothetically, you're playing this game blind. If you did not complete every objective and get every true ending for each character, you will not be able to progress. But that's not all. To unlock the fifth storyline, you also need to have seen every Majin. That means that you would have to have done every optional floor as well. 
Now let's say you played Tage's storyline first. See, most of the storylines are pretty straightforward to you about what they want you to do to get the true ending. Tage's is not. You have to kill a specific monster in a specific side area, then you have to capture a specific monster in order to use its special attack to break the demon aura for another specific monster in a side area that you have to defeat later on. Not only is this the most complex list of things you need to do to complete any of the stories, but it is alluded to so vaguely that I didn't even know what to look for on my first playthrough. So what happens if you miss the true ending? Well, you get to the third stratum, or tier as I referred to them earlier, you beat the stratum, and then your character says, oh, it won't open, we must have missed something. No hint, no nothing, start over. This begins New Game Plus. You can start over from the beginning and hit all the objective points from there. Here's the thing, your main party keeps all of their levels and equipment, and the monsters you fight don't change at all, so it should be a breeze to get through again, right? All of your mercenaries start again at level 1. All of the equipment that you bought them is gone. So now you need to go through all of the tedium of equipping and leveling up your characters again, and to top it all off, the visual novel cutscenes between each battle are still unskippable. If it took you around 11 hours to beat the game, it would take you about 9 hours to beat it in New Game Plus. Say you didn't hit an optional floor or completely skipped one of the branching paths, which is entirely possible. You will also need to go through New Game Plus to fight every monster in the game. After all of this, you unlock Count Dufastin's storyline. The fifth storyline. I can't even begin to describe how unfulfilling the four storylines previous to this are. Character goals are set up, they get to the end, they don't achieve those goals. You're forced to go through four bad ends before you can even try to unlock the true, true ending. It's not even like other bad ends in other games, where something terrible happens to the characters, or it's super bittersweet, or anything like that. It's just you get to the climax, there's no time to reflect or extrapolate on the climax, fade to black, Finn? Okay, I've gotten all that off my chest. The Dufaustin storyline, or rather the Morpheus storyline. The reason the main character always has a main party that goes with them is so that they can tell a story without sitting there and expositing their thoughts at the audience. This makes things feel very organic and good. Morpheus does not have any party members. He addresses you, the player. You are here to witness Morpheus' tale, and in a completely unexpected fourth wall break, you are now part of the Eternal Boys in Universe. Morpheus had realized that what would normally be considered gameplay abstraction, separate character routes, is a tangible thing that's happening within Bessic. Tage killed Valdis, time restarted. Olifin killed Valdis, time restarted. You get the idea. Morpheus was able to witness this and allowed his Librum, the Librum Aurora, to end up in the hands of each of these adventurers. In completing each of these scenarios and filling the Librum Aurora by witnessing each of the Majin, you've created an artifact that Morpheus believes can end the time loop, killing Valdis once and for all. At this point, the game allows you some leeway. You only have to complete half the game as Morpheus, sweet release from the tedium. As you progress onward, Morpheus explains his theory about the Libra Aurora and meets a few familiar faces along the way, Princess Lenarche and Tage. See the thing is, is Valdis wants to sacrifice Lenarche because only a royal maiden can be transformed into Izel. We find out that he had tried this with Tage before her, who was his wife, however it failed. Tage is Lenarche's mother, who is supposed to be dead, but is clearly not more mystery to Tage's story. Morpheus progresses forward and eventually defeats Valdis. Something is different this time. This time, Valdis was able to sacrifice Lenarche. The reason Tage couldn't be reborn into Izel is because the Libra Aurora was not complete. It is a key component. This time, Lenarche has been sacrificed, and here stands Morpheus with the Libra Aurora. Thus begins the true, true, true ending, the final tale. As Azel is reborn, all of the timelines converge. Tage, Morpheus, Olifin, Ashley, and Rondemian are all here and ready to fight a newly rebirthed Azel. Azel explains how she was using Valdis to lead people to complete the Libra Aurora and thus complete her rebirth. The eternal poison was something that was bestowed to a person who would bring about her rebirth, which is why Valdis had it, and it would reset the timeline if he should die without resurrecting her. You know, for a Majin god, that Azel sure looks like the god that the Valdians worship. Kinda weird that all the high-ranking Majin also share names with religious figures within the Valdian mythology. 
Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. The gang defeats Izel, and we finally get the sweet release we wanted. Only Finn is finally a good leader. Ashley has to grapple with the concept of faith and the fact that she just killed her own god. Ron Demian decides his work here is done and he's ready to fade into legend. And Morpheus is gonna go fuck off and do whatever he wants. And Tage... Wait, Tage. A character that has the mysterious Librum Vespera. The one who said she wanted to destroy the world. The realm of Vesic slowly began to vanish during the destruction of Castle Valdia. And the Librum Aurora, believed to be the only item that can summon Vesic, dissolved into the wind. Lost forever. The Magi, mankind's largest threat, slowly began to disappear from the world. And for a while, Alia was peaceful. The truth about King Valdis and Princess Lanage was never revealed. The tales of Vesic were kept secret, locked within the hearts of those who ventured there. However, the fear of Vesic returning one day was shared by almost everyone in Alia. And fortunately for them, they don't know that I still carry the Librum Vespera. <laughs> this is the end of the tale. You were there to hear the entire truth. And for that, you have my thanks. Maybe we'll meet again sometime. A sequel hook? Are you kidding me? As you've been playing Eternal Poison and talking to everyone in the game, you would have had to have realized that Besic does not exist in the same way that we perceive a normal place. You save refugees from strange lands seemingly completely different from the world that your characters inhabit. You save refugees that are ghosts. You save a refugee that turns out to be Olyphant's grandmother. Or Tage, being Lenarsh's dead mother yet still being alive. Besic does not exist within time or space. Those are concepts that do not apply to it. Which is why I can't hate the fourth wall break. Normally I would groan and rant negatively about it, but Eternal Poison has crafted a setting where my world, the world that this video is being created in, can be connected to it. I can be controlled by it. I am a character connected to Besic. I've been strung along by this story and my need to complete this game. Morpheus dragged me through a slog of tedium and unfulfilled hooks, desperately clinging to the idea that if I just complete these damn storylines, I'll finally be sated. Izel, however, had been prepared for Morpheus and dragged him along with her plans. She wanted him to bring a completed Librum Aurora to Valdis. I was never playing the game, the game was playing me. The characters were interacting with me in the same way I was with them. Creating a meta-narrative out of gameplay abstractions is fucking awesome and I love this concept. Now was it worth it? Fuck no. Not even in the slightest. A game that drags you through unfulfilling stories, blueballing you the entire time which also has a mess of a UI and pretty basic TRPG gameplay? It's not worth it. It was so not worth it that I messed up on Tage's true ending twice and gave up on it after completing four storylines and completing one of them three times. And like a good video game reviewer, I looked up the ending because the story is dog ass without it. I really, really want to like Eternal Poison. It looks awesome, it has great music, its story has potential for greatness. This is a game with extremely rough edges and I'm sure with enough polish it could have been simply fantastic. But as it stands now, I could never recommend it to anyone. It has too many small issues and the payoff of a sequel hook for the most important character in the game is laughable to say the least. While the game touches on interesting topics like ethical nihilism and the value of faith even after discovering your god is evil, such moments however are like a wisp in the wind, never there long enough to even scratch the surface about what makes those topics interesting. Eternal Poison is obscenely expensive on eBay. I'm pretty sure it's like 80 bucks. You know what you could buy with $80? 160 hot dogs from your local Sheets gas station. 160. Insane. Do you know what you could do with 160 hot dogs? You could eat for like 50 days. Crazy. But yeah, I mean, play this game if you're an insane person who likes the worst aspects of both JRPGs and TRPGs. Otherwise, I could never recommend it to anyone. Hey, Null Toxicity here. It's been a while since the last Reps to Gog, and uh, you may have been wondering why. 
Well, for one, this game took an insane amount of time for me to not beat. I definitely put like 60 hours into it. It also took me a while to actually collect my thoughts on Eternal Poison because this game was a doozy. I also got preoccupied with other things. <coughs> my time has also become way more limited as I started to work more. I'm still going to be making these things, although I don't know how well I'm going to be able to hit that three week turnaround that I was doing before. Um, I've been iffy on this for a while, but I've since created a Patreon. If you'd like to support what I do and allow me to put more actual production value into my videos, you can sub over there. You can also get a few things from it like access to my scripts before the videos come out, access to my save files, uh, special discord roles, and I might do that funny post roll thing that other YouTubers do for their patrons. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching, um, I'm gonna see you again soon, we're gonna get some cool PS2 games, I, I, I have some interesting stuff planned. Goodbye.